Thank you all for coming out. I fell into this one when I was just thumbing through the Virginia Chronicle old newspapers and came across a Chamber of Commerce story. I didn't even know we had a Chamber of Commerce in 1936. And a very aggressive, active organization at that point, and that got me into what I'm going to talk about now. I'll get to that story in a few minutes, but we all know we had hogs as a product here for ever since the early colonists. They were a ready source of protein. They were brought over from England for that reason. Easy to raise, raise themselves in the woods, and they did. And uh, they converted things that they ate to meat pretty readily, and still do. That's why it what makes pork an efficient meat product. So the English knew how to salt meat, Indian smoked meat. They put it all together, they end up with smoked, salt, smoked products. Hands, shoulders, heads, jowls, everything was smoked and, and salted because you had no refrigeration. And that came down to us until we got to the late 1800s. In this area, a unique sort of bond developed. They were raising peanuts here. And in those early days, they, they became commercially viable after the Civil War. Uh, soldiers learned to like goober peas, and after the war, there was a market for them. So this area, which happened to be just right geographically and, and climate-wise primarily for peanuts, started raising peanuts commercially. When they dug these peanuts, they had really crude implements to do it, picking diggers and hand-picking them off of vines. 25%, it's estimated, of all the peanuts raised were left in the field. Total waste if you just let them lie there, so... These farmers also raised hogs. They turned the hogs into the fields to eat peanuts in the wintertime as a cheap source of food for the hogs. When they killed these hogs, salted the meat, and they found that hams and obviously shoulders and so forth had picked up a lot of fat from the peanuts. And it seemed to not only give them a better flavor, it made them easier to, to cure, it made them long lasting, they, they held them moisture, the meat held them moisture longer and better because of the, of the diet they were on. And so they were, they'd been shipping these hams out since Maori Todd, as we all know. But this developed into something of a local thriving industry here, alongside the peanuts. And then they had the peanut fire, and the peanut industry moved to Suffolk and still had the hogs here. And I just never paid a lot of attention to it, but nobody in Smithfield was killing hogs at that time. They were all done on the farm, and, and as I read about it, this, this winter it, it, I realized that this was a really, really big deal. These farmers were killing up to 100 hogs a winter on the farm. Now, any of you ever been to a hog killing, and I have a few times, it's a big job. It's nasty, it's hard work, and you get up early in the morning, and if you're lucky, you have hogs hanging on the gallows before the sun sets. But it's an all-day operation to kill a dozen hogs. And these farmers, the DeShields, uh, some of the Ramses, the Havertys, they, they were killing up to 100 hogs a winter, and they weren't doing it one day. They would they'd kill a few this week and a few this week and, and hang them, inviscerate them, hang them, chill them overnight, hoping it didn't turn warm, hoping it didn't freeze because you couldn't freeze the meat. You'd have to hang burlap over them or something if it got too cold. Load them in a wagon the next day and haul them to Smithfield or VW Jordan. P.D. Gordon Jr., uh, Chapman, Ben Chapman, and not yet Joe Luter, because he was with Gordon at the time, were buying these carcasses off the farm wagons, hauling them into a little plant, cutting them up, 
salting the meat, and selling the fresh meat when they could, as quick as they could, because they didn't have refrigeration. So it was a wintertime operation. The whole hog industry happened, the, the production, not the production of the hogs, but the production of the meat products, processing of it, took place in the wintertime. It had to. And that was the situation for many decades. Uh, and there were stories in Smithfield Times repeatedly, uh, once a month during the 30s, early 30s, uh, there would be a story of something involving the hog industry and what was happening to the hog industry and the farms, uh, whether you were gonna have a big kill that winter, or whether you'd had a disease that affected them, everything. It was, a, it was just a really big deal in this community at that time. But this winter kill was key to it. And what these farmers enjoyed was uh, a market that was very flexible to them. They could go to Joyner, they could go to P.D. Gortney, Chapman, uh, Jimmy Spriggs, and say, okay, I got, you know I've raised good hogs, what do you give me for? and they'd negotiate a price and bring their hogs to town and sell them, the caucuses. All that was subject to change thanks to a national concern about uh, meat quality and people dying from poisoning and things like that. The people getting <laughs> concerned that maybe we ought not be doing it quite like we're doing it. And, uh, there was a Sinclair Lewis's ju The Jungle in 1906 highlighted the problems in Chicago and in the, in the big slaughter plants up there. And he was concerned about the immigrants that were working there. They were just living in horrible conditions. But the book scared the pants off people all over the country, not because of the immigrants, but because of the meat that was coming out of those plants. And so there was a huge push to get Congress to pass regulations on, on meat standard regulations. And the, uh, if I get the name of it right, uh, Federal Meat Inspection Act in 1906 began to put the brakes on this kind of thing, introduced government inspection. Government could condemn meat that it, uh, it thought was uh, not fit for human consumption. They exempted most farms killed animals at that time. It was a small operation and farmers had a lot of clout too. And this went on until the 1930s and that's when it began to come to a head and more pressure was being exerted on Congress and they eventually were going to do something. So that's where I found the story of January 17, 1935, Smithfield Times. I'm gonna take the time to read this because it really frames this thing better than I can. This is a meeting of a chamber of commerce, reached kind of like a minutes of a meeting. It says, one of the main topics of interest discussed at the meeting was an abattoir, slaughterhouse for the county. This is fast becoming a serious need to the county if Smithfield is gonna retain any of the old markets for the Smithfield ham. Richmond and New York City are now closed to all meat, not government inspected, and it's only a short time until all the cities will require the same inspection. If a slaughterhouse and refrigeration house is not erected by private capital or by a cooperative system, all the hogs uh, necessary to the industry must travel to Suffolk or Norfolk and where there is an abattoir to be slaughtered and inspected before the meat can be cured here in Smithfield, thus necessitating another shipment of the meat not before necessary. The outlook for the Smithfield ham is grave unless the farmer and citizen in Smithfield get together and stay together as one. The peanut industry has gone and marketing has become very difficult. Well, the Smithfield ham industry is on the way to the same fate through, um, unless through some plan, government inspection can be obtained that will satisfy the cities in which the markets, uh, which are the markets for the products. It's not too late. In fact, now's the time to erect such a plan. The necessary capital with aid from the government 
can save the farmer and the meatpacker and keep the industry from some large corporation which will surely take advantage of such an opportunity if given the chance. Why should farmer's meat have to be shipped to some city and slaughtered to be inspected before it can be sold? Smithfield has enjoyed the industry for years. A plant here or in the county will save the farmer many dollars and save the Smithfield ham industry much sorrow in the future. And it went on to say the comments on this are welcome and Chamber of Commerce will receive them and signed by the president F.M. Barrett, who is Ann Barrett's father and a prominent uh, Smithfield businessman. Within a month of that, P.D. Gorton had announced construction of, a, of an abattoir, of a plant on the north side of the creek. Now, I'll probably will show some slides at this point. They just really don't fit what I'm talking about, and I will show you a bunch. Before we move into that, we'll, I'll, I'll show you a few on hog killings on the farm. All right, these are a few pictures I've shot over the years of hog killings in the county here. I think this is the late uh, Gerald White, and he's uh, burning the singe the hair off a, a caucus after it was killed. You, First put them in water and then scrape them and mm -hmm. then you had, to, this is when they were in a kettle. You've got a couple of little kill, uh, skull kettles down here, but they're smaller than most of them that you find. Mm -hmm. they, they, these are pretty small. It'd be a small hog to feed in those things. But uh, this was a homemade rig out of a tank and they had built a contraption to lift the animal into it and back out of it so you didn't have to reach down it hot water and take it out with your hands. He's using a, a grubbing hoe to turn the hog and check the hair to see if it's uh, ready to be scraped off. There's some ladies down in Windsor area with a kill one uh, winter. And this is uh, hogs out of the Delt Farm, out on Mills Walk Road back in the 70s that I shot. Uh, and that was pretty typical size kill. A dozen hogs was, a, was about it when when I was a kid. Uh, Gordon, up until this plant was built, there were plants down on the Wharf Hill. Gordon had one there, had a store, a commercial store, and also had a packing plant. But the packing plant wasn't a slaughter plant. It's not a packing plant like we think of it. It was a smokehouse. It had a cut floor. These carcasses came in. They cut them up, salt them, hang them up. And, and this was probably part of that building was the original smokers of Wharton. Uh, it was still standing until all that stuff was torn down about 15, 18 years ago. Uh, this is a view from uh, Luter Drive, west of Luter Drive, which was back then Thomas Street. This is the old jail. And there's a the Wharton operation, the whole collection of buildings, there are commercial stores down here on, the, on, the, on Commerce Street. Uh, it's just another view of one of their buildings. And this is the loading area, the, the, the dock area that they had to bring the meat into, process it and so forth. This is their uh, original slaughter plant. And it was the first one built in this part of Virginia. And it was the one built on the north shore of, of the uh, Pagan River. The, uh, that was to set the stage for, for doing inspected meat kills. But interestingly enough, this is 1936, they still continue to take hogs from, that were farm killed for another two years. They didn't have the refrigeration even in this new plant to operate year round and to fully incorporate slaughter process and so forth. So they were still taking hogs off the farm and congressmen were busy trying to ward this thing off as long as they could. 1938 on-farm slaughter was incorporated in the, in the Inspection Act, 
but they still exempted farmers for a little while because they just weren't quite ready to get it together. In 1938, Smithfield dates 1936 as the year that we got a packing plant. 1938 is the year that Gordon had finished an addition that gave them complete plant, in plant air conditioning. And that allowed 12 month hog operations, processing. That same year, and it's interesting that the Smithfield Times was not politically unaware of all this. The front page had a story that the Gordon edition was opening that week, and then right alongside it had a story that Joe Luter and Pruden had opened the plant in Suffolk, or were opening it. And the Luter story becomes big. In 19, obviously big, but it started in 1936, Joe Luter was working for Gwartney. His father had worked for Gwartney as a salesman, Joe Luter worked for Gwartney, and became Gwartney's plant manager. In 1936, he was overseeing construction of his water facility for Gwartney. And according to Joe Three, whom I talked to before I did this series, his father, Joe Jr., and P.D. Gwartney Jr. had a good working relationship. But P.D. Gwartney Jr. died in 1936, and there were three sons who logically took over the, the company. Uh, P.D. Three, Howard, and Julius. And there was, wasn't room for a fourth, and that would have been Joe Luter. So he left and formed a tiny little company called Smithfield Packing Company. It had virtually no resources. He was underwritten by Peter Pruden in Suffolk. They built a little packing plant on the, uh, is, that, is that picture, that picture's not in here. Smithfield Packing built a little plant down on the Creek River next to Gwartney on the other side of Thomas Street, facing Commerce Street. And they were accepting caucuses in 1937 alongside Gordon and D.W. Joyner. Uh, somebody was still operating Todd's at that point, not Todd, but uh, a company was. And, that, and things were still moving along in that direction until Luter and Gordon, Luter Pruden and Gordon opened abattoirs, one in Smithfield, one in Suffolk. That gave them both meat off the farm to, to slaughter, hogs off the farm to slaughter. In the meantime, farmers were not happy about this whole thing because Gwartney had built this slaughter facility and it looked like Gwartney was going to be the only buyer of hogs that they could go to. They couldn't slaughter on the farm once the act was fully in place. They had to take a live hog to a plant and there was only one plant to take them to. Well, you know what's going to happen to the price when there's only one buyer. So they met with extension agents and determined that the government loved co-ops back in those days, cooperatives. They could borrow money to build a cooperative abattoir somewhere in Ottawa County. And that for twenty-five thousand dollars, they could build a hundred hog a day slaughter facility. <laughs> I don't know what that converts to today, but that's not a lot of money. That appears to have that idea appears to have come and gone very quickly. It just disappears from the newspaper. And I think when Pruden Luter opened one in Suffolk and gave them a competitive market again. I think that pretty well ended the ideas of a cooperative slaughter facility. It just, the idea disappeared. Um, so that's where things stood in 1938. Let's see what we got here. In 19, oh, this was uh, in the 1980s, the old packing plant of Gordon had been shut, uh, had been closed, and had been used for the warehouse and all kinds of different stuff and one night in the 1980s it created a roaring fire for everybody in Smithfield to see and burned to the ground. 
This was uh, in 1946, Joe Luter Jr. built, opened a packing plant in Smithfield on the other side of the creek. And it was the most modern facility at that point anywhere in Virginia. Uh, I'm told that it was the only plant at that point that was using humane method of slaughter where they gassed the hog before they actually did them in. And uh, this one was up on top of the hill as you go across the bridge. The Gordon one was down the hill. The, the local Ruitons and Rotary Clubs met at the plant and then the cafeteria and got a tour and everybody was thrilled to death. This thing was off the, off the charts as far as being modern. It would handle 1,600 hogs a day. And in 1946, that was just unheard of. Uh, when that opened, on the farm, commercial hog slaughter ended. I mean, it was it actually had ended about 1940, but this took care of it. You could still slaughter a hog, you could still cure a ham on the farm, you still can cure a ham on the farm if you don't kill too many of them and sell them, but it's very tightly regulated and, and very limited as to what you can do outside of tight government inspection, as, as it should be. Uh, Within just a few years after that plant opened, that was in 46, in 1961, I think, yeah, 1961, Gortney moved to a new plant, Plant 3, the only one that's left now is Plant Old Gortney, Plant 3. They built a new smokehouse over there. The town had to move the town limits to the other side of the smokehouse so that they could legally cure a Smithfield ham at their new facility, which they did. Uh, and by this time, hogs were coming from the Midwest to Smithfield to be slaughtered. This was a, the packing capital of the East Coast and was taking hogs actually from in the Midwest to, to fill the needs here. Uh, it made it, the, it literally the, the processing capital of the East. Uh, and what did they do to the Smithfield ham? Well, anybody here ever eat a Smithfield ham that was peanut fed? Yeah. I, I have, but it, I was but that big when I did. And that was a long time ago. It, uh, we did run them in the peanut field for a few years when I was a kid. But that ended in the late 50s. I mean, it just went away. When peanut pro uh, harvest got more mechanized, got, got better, uh, hog production got more efficient. Uh, there hadn't been a peanut in a hog over here in these packing plants in a long, long time. It wasn't a myth. I, I came to believe that it probably was a myth that, that peanut-fed hogs might have been unique. There, there really weren't. That, that, that high fat content of the peanut really did add to something to the, the quality of the meat. And it, it, it did make it easier to cure or, or better to cure the whole moisture, the whole business, and, and probably flavored it. Uh, but you wouldn't know it today. And it's, it, it's just totally a myth. It's been taken out of the language of the Smithville ham legislation because of that. Um, after this, whoa. This is just a couple of shots. This is one I shot in Smithfield Packing back when they were still allowed you to take a picture in there. It was 40 years ago. This one, I'm not sure which plant that's in. That's a museum picture of a cut floor. This was a kill floor. And then this is a cut floor, or probably the tail end of the kill floor before they were chilled. Hogs were opened up and they 
chill down better. A uh, couple of pictures inside there. This was nasty work. I, I don't know if any, any of you have ever been in the cut floor or kill floor of one of these packing plants, but it was, it was a grim place to have to work. And went away. I, that really precipitated me looking at it last year. Smithfield Foods declared they weren't going to kill it with hogs here. And uh, so it's gone. Smithfield Foods has become the story, and I won't dwell on that. You all know what's, what the story is, but it, it moved very rapidly. After the 1961 construction of the Gwartney plant, uh, 1962, Joe Luter Jr. died of a heart attack uh, young. He was, I think, don't quote me on late 50s, early 60s in, in that range. And was still very active. He was he was running the company, Smithfield Packing. Uh, within a few years, uh, Liberty Equity, a holding company, love these holding companies. They bought Smithfield Packing, and pretty well ran it in the ground. Joe Luter was forced out when they got control of it. He left, uh, went and built Bryce Mountain, Joe Three. Uh, that became Smithfield Foods in the late 60s. And uh, Smithfield Foods did tolerably well for a couple of years and then it ran into all kinds of debt problems. And in the mid 1970s, Smithfield Packing, which was its main subsidiary, was right on the verge of bankruptcy, ready to close. And Joe Luter was brought back as president and CEO of Smithfield Foods, <clears throat> put Joe, George Hamilton, who was a brilliant marketer, in charge of Smithfield Packing, and they turned it around. And within a very short time, it was profitable um, 1970, let's see, 1970s uh, back up, ITT had bought Gwartney, so that left local ownership. 1981, Smithfield Foods bought Gwartney. Uh, they, uh, and then went on to what you know it became a huge, huge international industry. In talking to Joe Luter III, which I always enjoy, an incredible amount of information in that man, he credited, and I, I knew it was big, but he credited the introduction of a lean hog that they introduced over here in the, uh, I guess it was the late, right, right around 1990, late 80s to 1990, with the company's extraordinary profitability since then. And here's where, here's where he had explained it. And Robert Manley was his, was the man in charge of that, Bo Manley. He, he brought these uh, genetically uh, bred, uh, hogs genetically bred for lean meat from England over here and introduced them. They eventually found they were too lean and they backed off a little bit and ended up with a lean hog that wasn't quite as lean as that and messed with it, you know, until they got what they wanted. When they ended up, now th this is amazing to me. When I was a kid and, and for many years, the average hog over there that they slaughtered was 218 pounds. 180 to 200 pounds was a grade A hog and anything under or over that you got cut and so forth. Uh, of that hog, you had about, uh, you'd cut out about 70% of that as would be meat. And of that 70%, 30 pounds of lard, about 19% of every hog that came along the gallows was lard, just rendered down fat. So you've taken nearly one fifth of every hog put it in a lard tin and gotten much good out of it. 
<laughs> of course, made good fried chicken, but it's, uh, it's not a very profitable use of meat. With the new hogs, the hogs that they are now killing across the Smithfield pack and uh, Smithfield Foods operation, now average 246 pounds. Of that hog, eight pounds of lard, 5% is fat. And that's just, to me, that's an incredible number. I mean, to go from 30 pounds off a 218-pound hog to eight pounds off a 246-pound hog is just an incredible thing. Of course, it's better for all that health. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's lean meat. It's good. But John, that product is still marketable, right? Yes, yes, they are, they are they are doing that. Yeah, that five percent, everything. Oh, you better believe everything's marketable. But it's but the the money is in the bacon, the money is in the loins, and these hogs are long. They have a lot of loin, a lot of side meat, and, that, and that's where the money is. I think that's but it, it, it. This peanut thing, I, I would love to get. And you may want to reach out to him. Sam Edwards in Surrey would make a wonderful lecture here on peanut-fed hogs. He's done. He did a huge amount of research on it. Uh, his small company in Surrey. And I am so sorry that it's gone, and so is he. But they were buying field-raised hogs rather than these genetically lean hogs. They were buying hogs with higher fat content and uh, uh, legacy bred hog, breed of hogs to to cure. And he was working with, I mean, they were feeding peanuts to them and they were, they were, they work, uh, there have been some research studies on the amount of peanuts that are good and how much is too much and so forth. There were stories back in the Smithfield Times in the 30s one of those stories on hog raising that you couldn't feed too many soybeans to them because you got flabby meat. I mean, they were they were serious about this stuff. They were they were they, they weren't terribly scientific, but they were they were watching what they were killing and curing and and knew what it was doing. And they said, don't feed too many soybeans to these hogs because you'll end up with some soft meat. And so this has always been an issue, and they've always paid attention to it. Uh, another little element, and I don't want to go on too long with this mess, uh, another little element that came in in 1900s, late 1800s, or 1900s was good fencing. Uh, every kid my age knows what an eight-strand fence was, and we strung a many a one. We had rolls of the stuff laid out in the backyard, and you run a temporary fence with stakes and just fence them into a field and then roll it up out the way after you were done with it. We had permanent lots, but we also had temporary lots. And, and every farm in this county was strung with fences everywhere. You go down through the woods today, you find a fence post here and there. But all of that stuff is gone because field crops don't require it and, and getting rid of it. But fencing was a big deal. And that came along about the time that they were developing this.